The following is a reading of a commentary on Leviticus, chapter 18, by Andrew Bonar, published in the year 1861. Chapter 18, verses 20 to 23. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. The word confusion means probably audacious depravity. And such is the human heart that all these forms of depravity were not too bad to be anticipated by the Lord who knew the heart. He knows the virulence of the poison spring. The Syrian has yell wonders that any should fancy, far less say, that he could be capable of a murderous deed. But the Lord Jehovah, looking on the unrenewed heart, forms this estimate of it, even in the case of his own Israel, namely, they might be tempted not only to adultery, verse 20, and to present their children to Moloch in reckless inhumanity, and perhaps in order to be quit of them, verse 21. By all this they brought public reproach on the name of Jehovah, profane in his name, Yet even beyond this would they go. Some might be led, verse 22, to the grossest and most shocking lust, man with man. And verse 23, man or woman with beasts. How awful is the Lord's judgment of the human heart. He believes that an Israelite, though surrounded, as an Israelite of course was, with everything that could fence in his morality, might nevertheless have a heart so foul as to burst all bounds and transgress all limits and overflow all banks. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Jeremiah 17.10 Surely in an unrenewed soul there is a secret connection with hell and the devil. Even as in a regenerate soul, there is a secret connection with heaven and with God. All these safeguards are needful to secure the peace and purity of human society. And if social order is, after all, but an external effect, what then must be needed to produce a real inward heart-pervading holiness? Verses 24 to 28, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity of it upon it. And the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourns among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. The land was to be cleared of its inhabitants who had committed these sins. Iniquity done in its secret places was crying to God for vengeance. And the land itself was loathing the foul sins it was compelled to bear. The land itself was spewing out the people. Again we see, as at the beginning of the chapter, that these precepts have all of them a place in the conscience. The law is written on the heart even of these Canaanites. And for resisting the law, they are punished. See again how even a smaller degree of light renders a man liable to judgment. Canaan suffers for its guilt, though the law was not given in words and in writing to them. What lukewarmness is in a sight may be inferred from the use of the expression in Revelation 3.16. 
the very expression applied to the most abominable state of society that could be imagined. O oh man, are you pleased in the world? Are you content with a hope? Are you going as far as possible to meet the world? Are you a decent, moral, nay, highly respected professor who avoids being overzealous, satisfied with being saved, though you are still unholy? Are you trying to gain both worlds? Are you thinking to walk on to heaven in a way that a scoffing world would not discover? Then tremble. He will assuredly spew you out of his mouth as if you had done all the lusts of lustful Canaan. How evident, then, that the slightest glimmer of gospel light will add tremendous force to the responsibilities of every one of us. Verses 29 and 30. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance, that you commit not any one of these abominable customs, which were committed before you, and that you defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. If the people of Israel at large fell into these sins, then they were to be treated as the Canaanites. If individual cases occurred, these souls were to be immediately punished. They were to watch against the first symptoms. In the case of Benjamin, a whole tribe, taking part with Gibeah. They were compelled to act upon these commands to the extent of not only excommunicating them, but even cutting them off with the sword. It was needful thus to denounce vice of every shape, ere Israel took possession of such a land. It was so not only that the memory of former days might be used to benefit them, but because it was a land where natural scenery groves and vales and green trees were all abused by former inhabitants to favor their lusts. Its delicious climate and luxurious fruits, if unsanctified, might tend to excite the gratification of fleshly lusts, like as did the fullness of Sodom, Ezekiel 1649. Plenty and peace are safe for us only when our souls are partakers of divine holiness. Israel's land combined these two things, and so was the type of the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, and at the same time peopled by nations whose heart felt the love and whose consciences bowed to the law of Jehovah. Perhaps it was in order to purify the land from these abominations in a manner or solemnly to pledge Israel at their entrance on it, not to share in the sins of the former inhabitants, that that transaction mentioned twice in Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine and 30 and chapter 27 was appointed to take place. It is recorded as having taken place Joshua eight thirty when they had penetrated into the very midst of the land and had it all before them in consequence of the taking of Ai, there were preparations made to pledge the people to a holy occupation of these seats of former lewdness. It was to take place in the valley between Ebal and Gerizim, a valley which is a mile broad at an average and beautifully adapted for a large assembly. Besides Jacob's well, and Jacob's tomb had made it well known. Accordingly, the camp moved hither. Six tribes were posted along the base, and perhaps a little way up the sides of fertile Gerizim, the hill of reapers. And these, as they stood amid the luxuriance of the spot, were to seal the blessings pronounced with their united Amen. The other six tribes were posted along the base, and a little way up the slope of the bleak and frowning Ebal to respond to the curses. In the midst of the valley stood the ark of God, and around it the priests, with the judges, officers, and elders. A solemn silence spread over all. Deep suspense and awe rested on the vast assembly. Joshua then proceeded to erect in Ebal an altar of stone, 
unadorned and so the better fitted to typify him who had no attraction to the carnal eye. Burnt offerings and peace offerings were presented on it to the Lord, and Israel's conscience bathed in the peace-speaking blood. Thereafter, while the fire still blazed, Joshua wrote on the side of this altar, which faced the whole assembly, a copy of the law. It was clear and distinct, the holy law on the altar sides. And no sooner was this done than the priests at the ark prepared to utter the blessing and the curse. Those nearest the hill of Gerizim uttered the blessings one by one and were distinctly heard by the six tribes on that side of the valley. At each utterance the tribes responded, Amen, and the voice of the host floated over the valley. Next, those priests nearest Ebal uttered the curses one by one. But will Israel say, Amen? Will their soul not tremble? Have they already incurred the curse? The six tribes, who hear the utterance of each awful curse, hesitate not to respond, Amen, Amen. It is like the Alleluia over the smoke of torment. The whole camp feels the awe of Jehovah's holy law. But we see how it is that they are able to respond so calmly even to the curse. Their eye can rest on that altar on evil, while evil's curses float along the veil. Do they not see in that altar the blood of sacrifice? Do they not see the peace offering? And more than all, do they not see the law, the very law, the violation of which ensures the curse, written on that altar side, and brightly shone upon by these flames of sacrifice? This is sufficient to give peace. There is a law receiving honor from the sacrifice, illuminated by the flame and blaze of sacrifice, as well as written on the altar side. Here then is the law honored and magnified by that atonement which their guilty consciences have free access to use. Application It is with our eye on the law thus honored by the sacrifice that we can bear to hear its whole demands made. It is when we see its curse exhausted on the victim, while all the time its every sentence shines brightly to view. It is then we can so calmly respond, Amen, Amen. We can look on evil and hear evil's curse as fearlessly as if it were Gerizim's beauty and Gerizim's blessing. And thus they depart, filling that the way of pardon, the sacrifice, the peace offering, has itself left the law's majesty and authority impressed on their soul. Israel must depart to their cities, carrying with them that day solemn views of the holy law which they will tell to their children's children. And the land shall be full of men who love righteousness and hate iniquity with the law of Jehovah on their hearts.